so much. And thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, I'd like to uh, start by uh, saying I'm really happy and uh, amazed at how many people have attended the conference today. It's a, it's a great sign towards uh, where Japan stands in the shipping community. I've, I've been to many conferences like this over the years, and I, they've been less well attended on both sides. So I think this is testimony to uh, both Capital Link, but also to the shipyards and ship owners standing broadly in the global shipping industry. So uh, uh, thank you. I'd like to then briefly allow Nishiyama-san and Asano-san to uh, introduce themselves and their businesses. Uh, Asano-san is a very senior individual at K-Line. And we're also very fortunate to have somebody from NYK to balance out K-Line. Uh, and Nishiyama-san runs a, an important part of their business. So firstly, what we will do is we will allow them to provide a brief introduction of themselves, their businesses, and then we'll go into a discussion regarding some of the more important matters which are shaping and will shape the Japanese shipping industry. And we've, we have a number of themes. One, which I think has been uh, under-talked, is decarbonization. It, it's, it, this, is a, uh, this is the critical issue of the 21st century for shipping. Forget about 2020. Uh, 2020 was behind us 10 years ago. Uh, I also want to talk about the role of regulation and technology. This is equally going to be important as we build enduring business models in Japan has been at the forefront of that over the last several decades. How does Japan take that opportunity again? And it wouldn't be fair not to discuss finance, given that we're at a capital link forum, so we will, we're going to touch on that as well. So I've talked too much, and I'm going to allow um, asano san and Nishiyama-san to talk a little bit more. So asano san Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Please don't sleep. Ne? <laughs> and uh, please allow me to speak in English. <laughs> My name is Asano, as introduced. Uh, I'm uh, from K-Line, Kawasaki Kisen Kaisha Limited. Uh, now I'm overseeing a group dry bulk business and also uh, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> Shifela te techniques, technology, and also environment uh, units. And uh, very briefly, I like to ex explain about Kerain. Uh, Kerain has just celebrated 100 years anniversary in last month, <coughs> April. Now we joined 100 years club. Uh, after NYK MOL, and now we operate uh, around 520 ships, uh, including container, car carrier, dry bulk, uh, tanker, LNG, all type of ships, almost. And my uh, role is to oversee dry bulk, as to dry bulk, we operate around 201 uh, dry bulk ships, maybe too many. Uh, most, most of them, not, not most of them, half of them are cave size. We operate around 110 cave size ships. And others are Panamax, Supramax, Small Handy, and chip carriers. So we overcame past 100 years. But uh, we just started first year of next 100 years. But this one year is much tougher than past 100 years, I feel. Because now we are challenging a global cap. <coughs> and also many issues around Japan in Pacific Ocean. 
decide this side is something. So very market is uh, market is very volatile and difficult. But uh, we are trying to do our best to survive in next hundred years. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Hiroki Nishiyama from uh, NYK Line. Um, uh, I'm a general manager of a steaming coal group, and the steaming coal is uh, uh, actually the uh, NYK is transporting the uh, steaming coal to the Japanese electric company. And uh, we are operating around 30 to 40 uh, Panamax and post Panamax power carriers. That's, why, that's my responsibility. And uh, uh, my career is uh, uh, already 30 years in NYK. It's a typical Japanese style, directly graduating from the university and the jump into NYK and 30 years, same company. And uh, I don't know if this is uh, still typical, but uh, it's a traditional type of uh, working. And uh, in these 30 years, I experienced uh, 15 years container liner business and uh, 10 years in LNG and three years corporate management and two years in the Balkans. So in Balkans, I'm just two years in here. And uh, let me introduce the uh, NYK a little bit. Uh, NYK is also a shipping company and uh, uh, we also have uh, more than 100 years history in this uh, shipping. And uh, actually now we are operating around 750 vessels and also we have around 600 uh, logistic sites site in the worldwide and we are also uh, owning the around uh, 12 uh, Boeing 747 as a cargo freighter. So uh, I can say that NYK is a kind of, uh, not only the uh, shipping company, but uh, more like uh, uh, logistics and uh, shipping companies. And uh, I hope that uh, you know, our business model itself is uh, uh, fit to the new challenges like uh, decarbonization and digitalization. That will also be a kind of a drive uh, for us to go for the next 100 years. Thank you. Thanks very much for those, those introductions. Uh, again, just to underline, I think, what asano san said, the next 100 years are incredibly important. And just as a precy to uh, some of the questions that we're going to talk about, when my, uh, my, my family, we had a, a sailing shipping business in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, which um, was during a very interesting time because it was just as we were moving from sail to, to steam. And we, uh, we unfortunately lost that specific business. It didn't move quick enough. They carried on raising sails when they probably should have been putting coal into the um, boilers. But this change in clock speed of technology and being able to adjust to regulation is critical. And whether or not we're at one of those Kodak moments uh, with regards to shipping will become uh, increasingly important. And on, and on that point, decarbonization. This is something which we only heard a little bit about over the last 10 years from uh, the industry, we had these EEDIs, there was some very loosely toothed regulation. The IMO has uh, put in front of us new guidelines for reducing CO2 emissions over the next 30 years. And th these are um, industry changing goals, which we're not necessarily all prepared for. It could have impacts. We are one of the large companies that we were a very large shareholder of, a large container ship leasing business. Um, they consume a lot of fuel. If you have carbon taxes, it could affect res residual values, it could affect lease rates, large value impacts. So, so how is Japanese business going to adjust to these potential th threats? Or do they see it as an opportunity to be at the forefront of ship in innovation, technological change? But that carries risks too. You could be too early. So as you think of a roadmap 
for NYK and for K-Line, how does that look for you given this decarbonization future? Mm. <clears throat> so or other operators again? As operators, yeah, uh, 2050 is too far from now. You agree? <laughs> so maybe I, I'm not, not arriving <laughs> at that time. <laughs> But your children might. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but uh, uh, as an operator of ships, uh, firstly, uh, I like to say that to, in order to meet that this CO2 emission reduction target, we need to address not only for new building ships, also we need to think about uh, existing ships. That is uh, operators' uh, one of the challenge, I think. And also, uh, technical side, uh, this should be uh, sorted by shipyard, maybe, or manufacturers. But uh, as operators, uh, we need to do uh, model innovation our business model innovation by measuring all aspects of ships and cargo operation. I mean, uh, uh, for example, uh, already we do, but uh, we need to do, we need to continue to do slow steaming maybe, and also we need to cut uh, ballast leg, uh, which might be help to reduce uh, CO2. CO2 emission. Uh, that is uh, uh, what we can do mm -hmm. now. Of course, besides that, uh, together with uh, technology side, uh, using and having our long history and experience, uh, we like to deal with shipyard manufacturers for to like, reduce emission. Mm -hmm. Is this answer for you? Yeah, I, I, thank you for that, Asano san And, uh, you know, I may come back to you because I think really the, 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 the challenge is so huge for us um, going forward that uh, we, we, may, uh, we may need to consider things which are, because 2050 is a long time away, but at the same time, if you make an investment in a container ship for 20 years, I know this is a different sector than yours, um, you have to be comfortable the technologies you have on those ships will be around in 20 years. And uh, when we look at potential investments in container ships today, we find it hard. Um, because we don't know how and what will power a container ship in 2035. And we need to know that because they come off lease. And you don't know what lease rates they then get fixed at and it affects residual values, and that's, that's our equity. So, um, but I, I agree with everything you said in the, in the near term. Yes. Nishiyama-san. Yeah. Um, what we can do now is maybe same as what Mr. Asano said, and that type of day-to-day uh, -day solution is uh, quite important. So, uh, as Mr. Asano said, uh, maybe EDI also will affect on the uh, slow steaming, and that could be also, also the solution. So that kind type of uh, you know, activity is also necessary for decarbonization. But on the other hand, um, uh, at the same time, maybe um, we have to see that that kind of uh, game changer change is a good opportunity uh, for shipping industry uh, to differentiate the uh, uh, business model. Uh, actually, the uh, now shipping companies like us is uh, struggling with the commoditized market. So uh, it's very difficult for us to differentiate ourselves from the, our competitors. So this kind of uh, challenge changes us to the more, how can I say, specific you know, areas. And uh, in case of NYK, um, in 2004, we established the uh, organization called uh, MTI, Monohakobi Technology Institute, 
that is a kind of R&D organization. And uh, that organization is created because at that time already that the environmental issue is a huge issue. So that's why we established that organization to cope with that kind of trend in the future. And then now, <coughs> you know, uh, such trend is picking up more. And uh, actually our midterm business plan is saying that the green and digitalization is the key uh, for us to develop our businesses. So uh, green means, of course, decarbonization is including. And uh, in case of green, that actually in 2017, NYK started the energy banking operation in Jinbiru Gibraltar already. So that kind of activity is already there. And then uh, we are now thinking to expand that kind of business uh, opportunity to Japan. So the, the actual, how can I say, uh, our expertise in, in Belgium is already imported to the Japan side. And now some energy bunkering project is starting in Chuberia and other areas in Japan. And that, that, that is a quite new move in the shipping industry. And we are seeing that as a kind of a, uh, uh, opportunity, actually. And uh, in addition to that, maybe I'd like to touch upon the digitization. Mm. And uh, that's also the big game changer, I think, in the shipping. Uh, our case, uh, ship information system, we are calling SIMS. Uh, that is a kind of a <laughs> uh, that is a kind of a, uh, a system uh, which can get the big data from the ships and we analyze it and then uh, we use that data for the uh, optimum operation and also we are using that for, how can I say, uh, predicting the uh, defects and dangers of the uh, machineries in, uh, in advance. So in case of us, uh, by using this SIMS system, actually we are founding the, uh, uh, how can I say, sign of the uh, accident in the, uh, no, no, not accident, the sign of the uh, trouble in the, in, in the engine, uh, maybe 100, uh, uh, 100, 120 times we are already finding that kind of uh, signs from the uh, ships and then we can prevent uh, engine trouble actually. Mm -hmm. So that is a kind of a new area for us. And uh, that is finally coming back to the good service quality to our clients. So that is another aspect of the uh, how can I say, new technology, good aspect. And uh, if we continue such kind of activity, that will also uh, lead to the uh, you know, differentiation from the uh, other shipping uh, com companies. That, 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 that's a quite... Uh, important factor for us. Uh, maybe for those who um, don't know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nishiyama-san, mm -hmm. NYK has a new bunkering business, which is very exciting. They act as a fuel supplier um, to uh, a number of key markets, including Belgium. And to, to me, it was surprising when I first had a delegation from uh, NYK come to, come to my office uh, that they were going to supply um, container ships other container line owners as well. And uh, th this was very interesting because I, I think as lessors, container ship lessors and other types of ships, we thought we were going to do that. You provide the ship plus the fuel. So uh, it, it shows how people are taking the opportunities of the, the, the decarbonization agenda in different ways. This happens to be an LNG st strategy, how uh, liner companies will be supplied with fuel, but there's many other example, so I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, you also mentioned technology, um, both Asana-san and Nishiyama-san. Uh, to me, this seems to be a, a large challenge for the, the smaller ship owners, the smaller operators. And there's obviously a lot of small owners and operators in Japan. And the, the balance sheets, the investments needed to capture these benefits will increase. Uh, if you're using Six Sigma technologies for measuring and collecting big data, which I know uh, both of your companies uh, utilize as well as companies like Musk and uh, CMA use, it's, in it's an incredibly expensive process.
but that's what you need to compete on a worldwide stage. How are those companies which don't have the resources, are they going to just disappear? Are we going to see more consolidation? Uh, what's, what's going to happen? Because it's, again, I think we're at a very profound change. Smaller owners could survive over the last 30 years because we didn't see such big changes. I wonder whether or not smaller owners can survive and operators can survive in the future. <coughs> I, I think the size of business is not the issue, I think. The important thing is how to have creative idea and also timely fashion action. Mm -hmm. That is important. Mm -hmm. If someone has such things, they can survive even though branch sheet is small. And also, uh, I don't want to eliminate mm. of friendly competition among companies. Fair com I know competition should be there. So that is second point. And also, uh, as you know, there are many ongoing projects uh, which are conducted by industries, government, and also academies. And also, those uh, parties are collaborating to, to comply with strict regulation, especially in technical field. So in such circumstances, even though smaller uh, shipping company need to uh, take action with creative idea and quickly react those things mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you for that. Do you think there's a role in the Shamasan as well for the small owner and operator? You, s you believe that we're going to have the flexibility, the creativity yeah. to be nimble enough to survive, or uh, does it, are we looking at a cliff? Mm. <coughs> um, I think the, uh, uh, actually, Japan has a very thick uh, industrial base in the, in the, in the shipping sector. And uh, at the last sessions, the uh, discussion was there already, and uh, so Japanese shipping sector is quite uh, strong already. Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond the boundary of the, uh, each sector, like uh, owners, operator, or uh, shipbuilders, or uh, makers, or then um, of course uh, we can exchange those experts with each other. And then such um, among such kind of uh, under such kind of circumstance, maybe we can create uh, new solutions as an industry. So that, that, that's why, you know, as Asana-san said, uh, big or small is not a question. So how the other industry we can develop the new things is uh, quite, quite important, I think. But uh, on the other hand, maybe, um, how can I say, the uh, technical recruitment of technical staff itself is uh, maybe key key issue, I think. So that's why maybe the uh, in that sense, the uh, role of the uh, ship manager would be also quite important, I think. In some part, you know, ship, ship manager will take a more important role for, you know, for, for such kind of new technology things. Yeah. I, I think that's a very important point on ship manager you, yeah. you raise. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the observations that we have is we see a lot of, and I, and I think there is a difference here, Small ship managers don't necessarily have the technical breadth because the resources that you need, the staff that you need internally, aren't necessarily with the ship manager. And you have, you can only have that type of capacity if you're a much larger um, ship management firm to understand the impact of the regulations, the technologies that you need. Um, so I, so I do wonder whether or not, in the ship management side, there will be forced consolidation. Maybe, as you say, in other parts of the shipping industry you can still survive. But I would, I would definitely question that on the ship management side. The next area I'd like to turn to briefly is regarding the clock speed of uh, technology change. <clears throat> and, you know, as I mentioned in the, in the preamble, 
I don't think we've had a comparable period of time in the last hundred years whereby we will see as many innovations and as many changes as we will have over the next 10. Even if you look at technology on container ships or large drivel vessels over the last 10, 12 years, there's been slow, but there's been incremental change. And Japan has been on the forefront of many of these technologies, whether or not it's been bubbling technology to help reduce consumption, different hydrodynamic hull shape to reduce friction, different paints, propeller systems. Over the years, when we've been building ships here, I've seen substantial innovation and change. So my question, I think, Asano san would be, as more and more of that value goes to the provider of technology, just simply owning the ship will not be enough. How are uh, manufacturers of those ships, how are uh, shipping companies going to build their capabilities to get more and more of the value chain and simply not earn a small return, which I would be concerned if that's what we were doing, if we were just a ship owner leasing our ships or operating ships, I would be concerned that over the next years, my returns continue to compress. So how do they, how are they gonna capture more of the global value chain? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I think the key issue is uh, for manufacturers and ship builders uh, to know users' need for which both com um, parties means shipyard and ship owners need to have communication and cooperation. Because, uh, as you know, uh, Japanese maritime cluster is rather big. If my memory is correct, uh, around 700 ships are involved in our cluster, consists of 2,500 ocean-going ships and also 4,500 uh, coastal ships. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, as I said, our operator owner has more than 100 years history where we accumulated uh, safety navigation measures. And also now we have uh, in total 700 we have 700 ships operating where we can have big data. Mm -hmm. Those things are very important to uh, think about next generation ships and also new technology. That is my mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think big data is sort of going to revolution? Because these are very, mm. oper you have to be an operator to mm capture this benefit. Yes, yes. Uh, not a great story if you're just an owner. Uh, it means that more and more value passes to the operator, yeah. leveraging big data. Do you, do you see the same yeah, future as Asano? I a, yeah, I have <coughs> definitely the same opinion with Mr. Asano. And actually, uh, one year ago, the, uh, the organization called ShipDC is established in Japan. And uh, that is a quite open forum. And actually, 60 companies already joining there. And uh, that is a uh, quite unique platform because it's not, nothing to do with the uh, did, did it by one maker or something, but uh, all players can get together and they exchange the data and they decide the rule. So uh, it's a quite open platform. So this is a little bit different from what we are having in Europe. And, uh, and uh, many data is better always. So that's why uh, this kind of, uh, we have a kind of, uh, how can I say, a, a good base to having this kind of uh, forum in Japan because we have a good cluster in Japan. So this is one of the examples. But uh, we, we as an operator and ship owners, we are really expecting to having a good how can I, solution mm -hmm. by having a such kind of uh, cluster. Uh, you know, cluster yeah? and a good forum to exchange the data and uh, develop the new new technologies. That's where I'm really we are really looking forward to having something new from there. 
I, I think a lot of mm. probably for the European <coughs> colleagues here today, mm. they probably don't necessarily see those clusters. Mm. Um, or we don't see them as much in Europe. It is a key differentiating factor of whether or not it's China or Japan. So you have these sharing of information and sharing of ideas amongst the business community. Um, and I very much, I, I, I agree, I see that as a, a key differentiating factor which um, will drive Japanese business. And maybe it's also something which uh, colleagues in Europe can, uh, can learn from. Um, one of the areas I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with, because I know we're coming close to the end of our time today, relates to the financial system. And for the, for the longest time, uh, the Japanese banking community, the, the leasing community, has been a, a wonderful source of um, a wonderful capability for the Japanese industry. It provides cost competitive capital, flexible capital, capital you work together as an industry. Um, do you, do you, think that, and I'm going to be careful with my words, do you think uh, in the future, because the Japanese banks, leasing companies, returns have been a little bit lower uh, over the last few years, as they look to improve their profitability, hmm. do you think we will see the cost of capital r rising hmm. in the Japanese industry? Um, is this likely to happen? Um, Will this, will this negatively impact your businesses? How will you navigate this? And I, I know there's a lot of banking friends in the, in the audience, so uh, we're going to ask them to put their fingers in their ears for a few minutes. Yeah, I, I, basically, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Japanese financing system can keep competitive uh, financing, I think. But, uh, as a fact, in the past few years, because of depressed shipping market, mm. our Japanese uh, operators uh, could not deal with new building program. But uh, in the other hand, Japanese ship owner, they need to replace their ship, all the ships with n new ships because of tax issue, whatever. <coughs> mm -hmm. Then, uh, for Japanese finance company, it was inevitable to go for uh, overseas project by Japanese owners. That is quite natural. Mm -hmm. But I think this is not uh, creating uh, incompetitiveness of Japanese financing company, because uh, project for foreign company does not mean uh, higher profit. Profit, you you, you can get <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. So anyway, uh, my uh, answer is uh, Japanese ship finance mm. uh, will keep competing for Japanese Points. owners mm. when we come back. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Mm. so that might be, that sounds like a message to everybody in the audience. Uh, Nishiyama-san, yeah, yeah. we have a minute. Yeah, I, I also have the same view, but uh, the uh, return rate, uh, interest rate is uh, depend on the credit, credit risk of the uh, borrower. So unless the credit risk of Japanese company like us is uh, deteriorating, deteriorated, uh, I do not think that the finance cost for Japan will uh, rise um, due to the impact of the uh, overseas uh, lending rate. And uh, maybe, you know, Japanese bank will gradually pull out from low return project in Japan, but uh, of course I believe that they are having their own portfolio. So maybe the credit risk and uh, how can I say more, how can I say uh, easy to, uh, how can I say, um, control the uh, debt itself, maybe the, uh, the uh, debt to Japan itself is also the uh, healthy portfolio for them. 
So that's why I don't think that you know our, our lending rate is getting higher based on the overseas lending rate. That, 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 that's what I will really not be. So that, uh, in that point of view, the, uh, my view is the same as Mr. Sun. Yeah. So that's uh, a good positive note and um, for Japanese owners. So I'd like, uh, now we're going to be out of time, we are out of time, so I think uh, we should give a big, uh, a big hand to uh, both Nishiyama-san and, and Asano-san, which you've certainly educated me, and hopefully you've learned something in the process regarding uh, the, uh, the Japanese uh, shipping industry and shipbuilding industry. So thank you very much. Thank you.